My guest on the podcast today is Reverend Alicia Gordon, or Alicia Gordon as we refer to her. Alicia is an awarded teacher, faith leader, and social strategist uh, whose work intersects social advocacy and culture. She is the founder and executive director of The Current Project, a not-for-profit organization committed to closing the social and economic gaps for Black single mothers, utilizing the intersection of strategic programming and policy uh, to lengthen their runway way for thriving. And we're going to talk about that word thriving in our conversation. Uh, she is a native of Decatur, Georgia. Uh, Alicia earned her bachelor's of English from Spelman College, and she has a master of divinity from the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. She has also served as the executive minister of programs at the historic Riverside Church here in New York City and the director of faith-based initiative, faith-based initiative, say that three times fast, uh, for national and citywide political campaigns, including Michael Bloomberg's brief presidential campaign. We always joke about that. I have to give her a hard time about that one uh, in 2020 and in uh, for Maya Wiley's historic mayoral race uh, for the city of New York in 2021. Please welcome to the podcast, y'all, a wonderful person, a badass black woman, a teacher, a preacher, a sanger, and a friend, and one of my former professors, Alicia Gordon. How are you, Alicia? Hey, Ricky. What's going on? That was quite the introduction. And that was quite the resume because that's what it is. That's what you've done. That's where you've been and you are doing even more. Uh, and she's also my Leo sister. You know, we're not like yeah. weird, superstitious like that, but you know, the Leo thing, we, we got the Leo the pride. Little energy, you know, got a little right. energy going. Eh, eh, eh. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing, Alicia? I'm good, man. I'm I'm here uh, in, in my hometown in Decatur, taking care of some family things. But, you know, I was like, there's no better time I like to spend talking to to you, Ricky, about all the things, all the intersections that that have spilled over uh, from Facebook into this podcast. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, all the intersections indeed. We we have some intersections between us. You got intersections in the areas in which you've worked. Uh and I think, you know, I always with these conversations, I like to start at the beginning to give people a little bit of context about who we're talking to and, and, and where you're from. So give us a little bit of your origin, where you're from. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing down there in Decatur, Georgia. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so originally from Decatur, I grew up in a Southern Missionary Baptist Church where women don't preach, wear pants, or lipstick, okay? Uh, <laughs> and I was in this, uh, I was a part of that Black church family that went to church four or five days a week um, where my daddy would line hymns and get him on bended knee in front of a wooden chair and tambourines and all that kind of stuff. And so that's really... Um, has shaped and informed who I am. A lot of my friends call me churchy, and that's really why. And so uh, growing up in this working class, blue collar family, church four days a week, um, and being a first generation college student, that would be the first time I would really expand my uh, horizons growing up in Decatur in an all black uh, elementary and high school, all black neighborhood, and then going to Spelman College where I would be introduced to this diaspora of blackness. So I was like, wait, everybody's not Southern? <laughs> Everybody know you fried chicken? Like, what you mean? Um, and so, you know, that is who I am, this kind of like Southern churched um, and then having this like these moments where education has been critical to uh, helping me expand my understanding of not only the world, but who I had the capacity to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, you know, it wasn't until I was, gosh, into my mid to late twenties was the first time I worked in spaces that were not all black. Right. Yeah. And really being able to think about like, what were the threads of my life and my upbringing that were really, um, shaped and informed where my life would end up going when I went to Emory and stuff. And so, I mean, that's, that's the, like, that's the Genesis story of, uh, in, in this, everyday working class family, church family who, you know, I would make this pivot into Spelman and that would be the place where the trajectory of my entire life would change as you, mm -hmm. as you know, and I'm sure we'll get to that part of this story too. We absolutely will. And, you know, what's interesting, you know, we, we're both Leos and, and we joke about that, but I, I wonder sometimes how much that does influence the kind of people we are because uh, one of the gifts I have is being able to do multiple things. One of the curses I have is to be able to do multiple things that yes. people always get on me about focus. Oh, you change and mm -hmm. you do this and that. But for you, I mean, you're an ordained minister. 
You served as executive minister of programs at Riverside Church in New York. You worked in politics, as have I. Um, you've uh, co-hosted a podcast. You're running a not-for-profit. Uh, girl, what can't you do? <laughs> and what, is there anything you can't do? <laughs> I mean, you know, there are plenty. But, you know, I, I love this kind of like what you're naming, these kind of what I have always called these parallel tracks of my life. Um, and these parallel tracks, to be honest, I think, people tell this story that I've always been called. I've always known I was going to do great things. I did not. Okay. I was out here floundering <laughs> and figuring out life and failing really badly. And um, thankful for the community, reliable others who was like, girl, it's all right. I got you. But I would venture to say probably the last 10, 12 or 12 years of my life, those very clear parallel tracks around social activism, politics, nonprofit work, um, and and religious uh, and being in the religious space has really been where my gifting has shown. You know, I think I've I I was almost thirty. I was at thirty three years old before I realized I had the gift to teach. Right, yeah. I was thirty years old before I got a passport. Right, and I was twenty two years old when I had my first and only child. Right, and so there are these what my friends often call these quantum leaps of my life where God has like propelled me into different places and spaces. I never thought I would be into politics in that way. Um, but every quantum leap that God has kind of like propelled me to, it often felt like this is weird. This is out of place. I never thought I would be doing this. And then for there be another leap where God is like, okay, remember when you did that and then you did that and then you, now you're doing this, all of that stuff makes sense to the ultimate calling and the work that I'm doing um, on the nonprofit piece. So, I mean, listen, Leo's love doing lots of good things, uh, but it's been a gift to kind of just settle into the common threads yeah. of of that work and these experiences and still being open to like what it's going to turn into. I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's important to talk about that. And I brought that up for a reason because I think we often as human beings have this limited understanding of the vocation that we are yeah. called to and the vocation that we participate in in our life and things that seemingly are very different on the surface often have a very clear thread that runs between them. Because when you think mm -hmm. about it, although you worked in faith and you work in politics and you're now running a not-for-profit and they seem like vastly different worlds, mm -hmm. you're serving people. You're advocating yeah. for and caring about people. You're caring yeah. for people. There's a very common thread that runs through that. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. we just get so caught up in the earthly uh, title that we forget about the common thread that binds all those things together. Yeah. Um, One of my mentors often, you know, I remember being in grad school and I was like, none of this makes sense. Like I used to teach high school and now I'm in seminary and now y'all thinking I'm called to preach and now I'm, and then none of it makes sense. And I was like, what am I supposed to do all this when it comes to a career? Right. Mm -hmm. And my, um, my professor, he said, gift things are some, are sometimes you, you are using gifts more in some seasons. And you're leaning into that thing and the other thing is on the back burner. And then you'll find another season where that particular gifting is pulling to the back and you're able to use another one. So he said, don't count, don't, don't get so consumed, but needing to bring all the threads together at, at one time, because every thread that you have is actually the thing that you're going to be able to use when it's time to use it. And that thing set me free, baby. I was like, Whew, I don't have to be a preacher, teacher, political person all at the same time. Great. You know, I could just use, what it is that I have at my disposal at the time to get where it is that I need to go. So yeah, that thing freed me. Exactly. It's his toolkit and you're walking around mm -hmm. now and every, every step of the way you're adding another tool to your kit and you never know when you're yeah. going to need those tools again. Never know. There's, there's things I learned working at Popeye's in high school that served me well <laughs> now. I mean, you know, you just don't know. And that's why I take and I encourage people, whatever you're doing, whatever the gift is at that moment, to lean mm. fully into that, to be present in that, because you never know what that skill is going to do for you later. And if you mm -hmm. wasted that time, you wasted that energy and you didn't really get the most out of it and really didn't yes. learn that well, hey, you don't have that at your disposal. That's good. Know, the other thing for you that emerges for me is I've also, you know, you're a teacher. And mm -hmm. that's central to your calling, too, because when you think about the work you're doing with not-for-profit, you're teaching people how to, to – 
to live these more fulfilled lives. You're teaching mm-hmm. people about the challenges that face the people that you're advocating mm-hmm. for. So teaching mm-hmm. is really at your core as well. And I can speak to her ability to teach y'all because full disclosure, she was uh, one of my professors in seminary. So I am yeah. well versed in her ability. We to had teach a good time in that class. We had a good time. We had a good time. She was there when I preached my first sermon, y'all. Yes, I was. And he preached that, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. But, uh, you know, I also, you know, as we continue that thread, you know, how has your intellectual curiosity and and your courage to be open to serving people in, in, in varying capacities both challenged you and led you to this current moment that you're in in your life and your career? That's good. Intellectual curiosity. I I think (laughs) the word that stands out to me in that phrase is the curiosity about curious about what I had the capacity to be. I, I found, I find, and I have found in my life is that our resistance or our fear or our hesitation into moving into that unction that we have, that gut thing that we have, is that um, we're afraid to be curious because curiosity is actually the thing that allows us to try just a little bit to see whether or not it fits right. And I think we live in a world where we are socialized. We, we, it's, it's taken out of us as children to yeah, not absolutely. be curious, right? Because curiosity actually can harm you is what we tell kids, right? To be curious about the fire is actually something that harms you. And instead of creating an opportunity where you says, yeah, curiosity about the fire can harm you, but it is my role to teach you and expose you to the capacity and the power of fire, for example, right? right? And so I found in the last decade that this intellectual curiosity that I have and the work that I've been doing is deeply connected to my own curiosities about who I had the capacity to be. I think about this, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Teresa Thames, she's, she often talks about a possibility model. Mm-hmm. And this notion of many times our inability to imagine who we can be is because we don't have a model of possibility. We just don't know what it looks like, right? Mm-hmm. And I just have found that over the last 10 years that I've been looking in different corners and sections of the world and communities and and taking on opportunities to teach and to do these things was that curiosity that fueled my ability to see what was possible. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to take all those little pieces that work and the ones that don't. I'm like, that sounds crazy. I don't want to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, And bring them into the essence of the work that I do now, leading the current project and really creating the conditions for mothers, Black single mothers in particular, to find to be curious about their own lives. Like, what does it mean to now be on the other side or this part of motherhood or your life and be curious about what is it that I really feel compelled to do and what is it going to take for me to get there and be curious about the people, places, and things that will help us get there. So I, I love that question. I love this intellectual curiosity because when I try to follow the thread of where I began to where I am now, a lot of it doesn't really make, apologies, a lot of it doesn't really make sense. Um, Mm -hmm. But the curiosity of it all is what kind of is the bomb that I need to to continue in this path of trying to discover and be myself, so. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good stuff. And I knew you, I, I knew you felt it deeply in your soul because again, being around you, I can, I could see the kind of person that you are and that you are curious and you are, I won't say fearless necessarily, but you're willing to walk into the fear, into the unknown, mm, uh, to mm. see what's on the other side. I and, do. I love it. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a risk taker. Mm-hmm. I've had to be to get to, from a place of being this, Black single mom who was like on welfare, facing eviction, like in the very weird, icky space of like, I don't know who I am or what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. To now, I had to take so many risks. And taking risks as a just a single person with no kids is one thing. Taking risks with a five-year-old on your back, (laughs) you know, is a whole nother thing. And so I appreciate, you know, you seeing that and naming that because, um, 
risk, curiosity and risk have really gone hand in hand in this journey. So, Yeah. And I, I just think it's so important for us to talk about this publicly, to share it with other people, because as a species, what, you know, gets us uh, to where we are is, you know, in mass, we are kind of risk adverse, right? We're like, mm. you don't know what's around that corner. You don't know what's mm. in that forest. You don't know what's on that prairie. It might eat you and that'll be the end of you and the end of us. And, and there's a space for that. But then there's those yeah. mavericks. There's those people that are willing to walk a mile or 10 in front of the tribe and see mm. what's out there and to probe and to experiment. And uh, we've got to really be mindful of that balance that we need to strike, particularly as parents, particularly as mentors, ex- particularly as uh, elders in the community to, yes, people know that there's danger. We've got to allow kids mm. to understand the risk that exists uh, when you take chances, when you play with the fire, when you when you stand on the edge of that porch and you might fall and hurt yourself. But at the same time, we can't be so protective that we will be beat out of them or we uh, Mm. intellectually and and orally make them afraid of taking risks, Mm. make them afraid of going inside and figuring out and determining Mm. who they can be and what's possible for them. Uh, It's so so important for us to talk about these things um, and to give us... Particularly as people, as as people of color, we are bred to be safe, to be careful because we live in a suppressive society. You know, don't go on to the other side of town because you don't know what the police are going to do to you or them white people. And it's possible and it's true and it's real, but you also are creating this prison of your own making. But you know what, Ricky? You know what, though? I love this because, you know, God was a risk taker. Mm-hmm. Like to like to create this whole world, beautiful perfection of world, and then put us in it. That thing is <laughs> risky, fam. Like, <laughs> do you know humans? Like, why would it do? That? And was, even your you? point, <laughs> even your point about like people of the diaspora, um, often needing to be uber careful and like mindful of where we go and what we do, and that social conditioning around um, being careful. But the innateness of us, are we are risky, innovative, throw it to the wall, boss to the wall people, right? And it's mm-hmm. that kind of risk taking that has created the innovation of, of our people, right? The inventions and the music and the culture and all of that. And, and, and thinking about the definition of risk is to be able to, is the action of doing something in um, contentious conditions, right? It's very risky if, if the conditions are well. Exactly. Right? Right. And so, I mean, I just love I just love this notion about risk and what we're talking about um, and reminding ourselves that we are innately have the, the capacity and in, in, in thinking about the ways that innovation have come out of us and out of our God selves um, made in his image to say that, like, I took a risk when he when he created us and was like wrestling with our presence and also creating conditions for us to think about, like, what are the risks that we are willing to take, not only for ourselves, but for community, right? And yeah. Oh, that's good. So good. And it's so real. Right about it. I mean, because <laughs> if you don't take a risk, sure, in theory, you're relatively safe. You've got nothing to lose. Mm. But yourself. Yes. Because yes. if you don't risk learning what you're capable of, you could lose yourself. If yeah. you don't risk learning who you can be and what you can be and what you can mm. contribute, you're going to lose yourself. You yeah. have to be willing to take that risk. And and I commend you for that because the work that you're doing with the current project, which again, you guys is a not-for-profit organization committed to the closing of the social and economic uh, gaps for black single mothers. You can't do that. You can't do that work without storytelling as an element in the work. Mm. You've got to educate people who are supposed to support it and contribute about what Mm -hmm. it means and what Mm -hmm. it is. And for the single mothers, they have to get to connect to you or to the organization personally, knowing that these are people that understand them. So you can't do that work unless you're committed to telling your story. And you can't tell your story unless you've (laughs) learned to embrace and love who you are and your journey. That's right. How did you get to that space? What what in you got you to this space where you're comfortable sharing your story and who you are so freely uh, in an yeah. effort to help other people? You know, it's a it's a plot of the enemy to make us feel ashamed about who we are and what we've gone through, right? And my ability to just tell the truth of 
my story and who I am and the things that I've done um, was, is just deeply connected to um, this idea of if I don't tell it, it is going to eat me alive. If I don't share it, <laughs> it is going to consume me, right? And this is not the kind of, we talk a lot about this in like preaching spaces. It's not about bleeding on people and just like unprocessed like trauma, but it is about how, what are the common threads of my story and experiences that I can share that I know someone else can pick up that thread, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> the story of the current project and the work that we do is deeply tied to a transformative and in, in many spaces people would call shameful moment. Mm -hmm. I'm a senior at Spelman College in 2004, two months shy of graduating. I wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to be like the next Khadija James and go to New York and like be a writer. And I was in the middle of applying for graduate school, University of Maryland at College Park. And I would learn that I was pregnant with Ashley on Spelman's campus and that that McVicker Hall where, you know, the <laughs> you can go in there for a broken toe and they're going to give you a pregnancy test. It don't matter. Okay. <laughs> so they're like, let's just test you just to be sure, right? So I go in, I learn that I'm 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 pregnant. I come out of the out of the infirmary and I sit on this bench that's right outside under this shade tree. It's you know, it's March, it's probably eighty degrees outside. And I remember throwing this tote bag on the ground um and just weeping. I'm twenty one years old. I am the first to go to college. I had no real guidance or mentorship about how to navigate the college experience, like how to take advantage of, of opportunities, how to talk to professors. I didn't have any of that. I literally was just flying by the seat of my pants, figuring it out as I go. And thank God for friends who were like more savvy than me that was like, girl, this is what you should do. But that is the conditions by which I'm getting this news. And I had this hope, this dream of like, all right, I'm going to take a risk, leave home, and go to University of Maryland to go to, to journalism school. And I remember sitting on the bench, weeping and crying and snot running. It was just, <laughs> it was gross. And I remember looking down on the ground and at the top of my uh, folder was, I could see the University of Maryland application name. And I remember saying to myself, well, that shit is never gonna happen. It's just never going to happen. Yeah. And 17 years later, I've reprocessed that moment and, and trying to really get to the depth of why there was so much sorrow. And I, I think I often thought it was like this shame of being a black single mom and this shame of carrying on this like generational curse of black mothers who are having children out of wedlock. All of the things that this Southern Baptist missionary, Pentecostal, non-denominational <laughs> upbringing had, had told me about my value, my body in these choices. But it wasn't that. The real sorrow was that I felt my dream slipping away from me. Slipping away. That which I had the courage by the skin of my teeth to figure out like that might have been the next step for me is to go to journalism school was slipping out of my hands. Mm -hmm. And that is why I was sorrowful. And it is, the, it is that moment of knowing in an embodied way what it means to lose a dream is what fueled my work behind creating the current project. Because from that moment in 2004 to when we found it in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, um, the, the focus was really about what do we need to do? What do we need to give Black single mothers? How do we resource them so they can reclaim their dreams? Mm. That was the beginning of it, right? And that really has shaped and informed why between that 2004 and 2020, I have been so transparent about who the hell I am. Mm -hmm. People be like, I don't tell you, yeah, there ain't no secrets. Type my name, a keyword, you will find a blog about it. I done already talked about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I done already talked about it. Don't worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
that is what fuels the work that we do. That is fuels why we raise money to say, listen, if a mom wants to go back to school and she is $2,000 short because of a one class, we want to put the money in her hand so she can finish it, right? Mm -hmm. If she wants to start a small business, she has a viable business idea and she needs $500 for her website, we want to put the money in her hand because we trust that your experiences as a black single mother, one of the most innovative members of our community, knows exactly what it is that you need. And we do not want things like whatever you feel like your shameful decision was to get in the way of you reclaiming your dream. And the last thing I'll say is people always often ask us, well, why do we connect this kind of strategic programming to policy work? Well, when I think about the trajectory of what I just told you, and how reliant I was on things like food stamps and WIC <laughs> and housing vouchers and, you know, discount plans for the MARTA. Mm -hmm. All of those policy things were essential to me being able to close those economic gaps, even if by a bit. Right. But what right. I have found is that when I made one penny over that threshold, what happened? They took those food stamps from me right. and now I'm food insecure. Right. And so it's not just enough. We can't program our way out of poverty. Right. It's not just enough to do that. But we have to think about what are the policies that ha and social structures that have to be in place to actually to sustain the thriving. And so that's why we do what we do. And that's the story, Chad. That's why we got here. But that's a good story. And that's good stuff. And it's real because, I mean, I remember when my and it's not a secret, so I can say it out loud. I remember when my niece came to me and I was the last person that she told that she was pregnant because we sat around the dinner table a few years earlier and uh, her and her brothers, and we talked about what their dreams were and what they were going to do after high school. And she had it. I mean, like most sisters, she had it all figured out. I'm going to do this, uncle, and then I'm going to write this book, and then I'm going to do the thing, and the, the, the mm -hmm. thing. And she came to me, she's like, so you probably heard, and I'm pregnant. And and I'm listening. Of course, I heard. Cause you know, our families are black families, right, honey? Everybody. Tell all our little <laughs> business, child. <laughs> but the the first thing I said to her, and if it wasn't the first, it might have been the second. The first might have been "I love you," but the second thing I said to her was like, "Okay, so what do we need to do for you to be to get the stuff together so you can get back to school?" Like, Period. the dream is not like, girl. <laughs> How do we get back to the dream? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I don't know. I just realized that that was really important. I, on the flip side of that, I wasn't as ready. I wasn't as mature. I didn't know what to do or how to help my sister in a similar mm -hmm. situation much earlier in life. And so that leads to my question, you know, this difference between surviving and mm -hmm. thriving. Mm -hmm. And what can we all, what, first of all, what is the difference between the two as you would describe them and define mm -hmm. them? And what can we do as a culture, as a society to, to help with that situation and to help people to be in a situation where they can thrive as opposed to just survive? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we at the current project use that language a lot, this kind of dichotomy between surviving and thriving. Um, mm -hmm. And I often find that surviving is, this is exactly how it sounds is that we, it's not only just a day-to-day -day thing where you are robbing Peter to pay Paul or you're, you know, moving pieces of the world of your world around to, to really hold things together. But it's also about <laughs> survival mode. It's also an embodied thing. Is that and I and let me, let me better say this through an example. When I first moved to New York in 2016, um, got a job working for a United Methodist Church in their women's division. And I was probably making the most money I had ever made in my life, a good $80,000 job. I was like, baby, that's the point, okay? <laughs> But if you know anything about New York City, $80,000 ain't, <laughs> ain't what you think when the rent's $2,500 a month, okay? But close. I remember, I remember um, talking to somebody. So this is the first time we had, I had made this much money. It was the first time in over a decade we were not on social safety net programs like food stamps and, and things of that nature. It was the first time. First time that we were not on state-issued health insurance. And I remember talking to somebody about my story, my journey, and how I ended up in New York and all this kind of stuff. And I remember saying to them, yeah, you know, I'm a welfare Black single mom. And I was like, wait. <laughs> I do that, bro. <laughs> right? And I remember having to, like, not only back myself up to take that welfare piece out, 
but also do some real like unearthing about why my language was still in survival mode. Mm-hmm. Right? Why was the way that I was telling my narrative and sharing my story, even though all of the external factors had changed, right? I was still using the survival mode language. And so when I, we talk about survival, it's not just about the day-to-day, but it is about how those day-to-day experiences in, um, impart themselves into us about our identity and who we have the capacity to be, right? And so on the other side of that, when we think about thriving, um, at the current project, we take a holistic approach about thriving, right? A good friend of mine, uh, I, won't, I won't say her name because she don't want me to tell her business, but I remember her talking about she, she does well for herself. She's a single mom, has two kids. And I remember she was saying, like, I don't know if I, you know, I ever I'm in survival. But I feel like I'm really thriving. I said, well, what makes you say that? She said, well, you know, I, I got a good job and, and I have a little bit of money in the bank. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm doing good. And I was like, great. That's great. Good for you. And she turned back a couple of weeks later and was like. I really need to come back and talk through this notion of why I thought I was thriving because I had money in the bank. Because I feel emotionally low. I feel disconnected from community. I there and she starts naming these laundry list of things that really are countercultural to what we say is to be thriving and popping in the world. And so when we talk about thriving, we really focus on this holistic approach about what does it mean for Black single mothers to see, to feel whole and to be seen as their full selves, right? So it's not only just about self, but it's also about how do we begin to reimagine public narrative about what it means to be a Black single mother. And so that is the dichotomy between those two worlds about what it means to be surviving and thriving. How is it that we create the conditions for Black single mothers to thrive, to, to, to see and to be seen, right? To be able to not only put money away from a rainy day, but also feel seen and heard and nurtured and embraced by community, right? And to be yeah. seen and heard and embraced by the people who are responsible for creating policies about them, to be seen and heard and loved and embraced by their own families, right? And so yeah, that cool. wholeness is so essential to how we talk about uh, thriving in our work. Um, and this is not new. This is like Alice Walker and Tony Cape and Barra and Tony Morrison. Like this is <laughs> like this is coming from womanist theory thought, all this kind of things about what it really means to be whole in that sense as um, a thing of thriving. So if there's one piece missing, then there's not thriving, right? And that's that's yeah. the gap that we're trying to close for Black mothers. Yeah, that's good. That's good, Alicia. And, you know, a couple of things emerged for me when you were talking. One of them is, you know, we have this thing as human beings, <clears throat> excuse me, and especially as Americans, where we confuse circumstances with mm. identity. Yeah. Your circumstances are not your identity. No. And that goes no. for negative and positive. That's right. Your identity is not wrapped up in your circumstances. And we've mm. got to get out of that thinking. And the first way to be out of that is to be present in it and be mindful of the fact that mm. so many of us do that. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the second thing is, and I think this is a cultural and societal sort of thing. You know, we're both people of faith and, and we, you know, we have read the Bible and had it taught to us <laughs> by our parents and grandparents. And then you taught me, you know, you were one of the first people to teach me how to exegete and, and understand and read the Bible, uh, uh, in the way the scholars do and to understand it for what it is. But that is the backdrop. What I'm getting at is, you know, we forget about, being human, being a human being. Genetically, you know, we are programmed uh, to, to procreate. We are programmed mm-hmm. to exist in community and to find ways to do that. And it's not particularly unnatural for somebody who's at 17, 18 years old to be attracted to the opposite sex and, <laughs> and to want to, to engage. It's mm-hmm. One could argue if you take religion out of it, it's a very natural thing. Sure. To do. But Absolutely. what our society has done as it's removed the support system that would naturally be there for people that have Mm -hmm. children when they're Mm -hmm. young. Children are supposed to be raised in a village. They're supposed to be (laughs) 
grandparents and uncles and aunts mm-hmm. and neighbors mm-hmm. and the play on mm-hmm. and whatever in the child's life. Whether you have the child at 18 or have the child at 27, they should benefit from a community of influences, a community of people that love them and also that can protect them. Because sometimes, you know, you and I both know that people can be born in the households that aren't safe. They could be getting abused, but there's less of a chance for them to suffer that kind of abuse uh, when there's some kind of protection and somebody intervening if there's a village there. So That's one right. of the basic things is, you know, black single moms aren't necessarily the problem. We're the problem for not enveloping Ooh. people in the kind of community and support system that they need. Um, Yeah, but I mean, but you speak to that and and that that leads me into your, or and I believe you got this from somebody else, but this idea of a community of reliable Mm. others. Mm -hmm. Unpack that please, because I want people to understand what that really is, because I think that's powerful. Yeah. Uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. That's the Reverend Dr. Gregory C. Ellison II uh, over at Emory University. That is his language around this community of reliable others. And Mm -hmm. I want to take like a word by word breakdown of this. Obviously, we know what community means. I think you just did a beautiful job of defining what we mean by community. Um, Both those people who are near and far. But the, this uh, community and others is anchored by this thing about reliable, yes. reliable others, right? And there's some intentionality around that around that word, right? It's because I think, and I, you hit on it so so well at the top of your question about this kind of what I'm remembering as American individualism, right? Mm-hmm. This kind of notion that we are all individual, we're all responsible for ourselves. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? But reliability is about a shared accountability to one another. Because many of us live in community and we we call on community in many ways. That was like a Wakanda thing on the web. <laughs> the spirit of Wakanda. So. Absolutely. <laughs> but we call, you know, on community, but often find that we are in a part of communities where there's no reliable accountability to one another. Mm-hmm. Right. Where we mm-hmm. still experience pain and harm and trauma within the community. So this yeah. notion of being a community of reliable others is about a reciprocal um, relationship between those people who are engaged in the community. And then mm-hmm. the others, um, you know, for some context, uh, Greg, Dr. Ellison's work often talks about this notion of the stranger, you know, this this notion that we have familiar strangers all around us. So if you live in a place like New York City, if you're going to the office every day at 8 a.m. and you live on 130th Lenox, there's a chance that every time you go to the train station at 125th Street, you're going to see the same people, yeah. right? You see the same bodega guy, you see the same mama with the stroller, because everybody has this rhythm about their lives. But he talks mm-hmm. about the familiarity of the stranger, these others, and about what does it look like to have a community of reliable others who are right outside the scope of the people that we call community. There are sometimes even people that we even not even imagine to be community or to be our neighbor, right? And so when we talk about this notion of community of reliable others, and as that almost concentric circles of, of groups of people who are responsible for one another, is really the way that we begin to move out of this notion of individ- rugged individualism and back into a real community format that allows for the social and economic and physical and mental wellness of entire groups of people, right? And so I, I use that word, I use that phrase at nauseum all the time, and I appreciate you. You're so good at this for asking me to break that down because nobody has ever asked me, like, what you mean? That sounds so great. Nobody has ever asked me, but it's about the familiarity of community. It's about the ways in which relationships happen through a reliable accountability. And it's also about those people who are often right on the outskirts, Mm -hmm. right? Who are the familiar stranger, who for all intents and purposes are equally responsible. We are equally responsible for each other um, more than we think. We see this so much in today's society of people being harmed and attacked and beat up. And what are folks doing? Filming. Watching. Right? Observing. Watching. Observing. Mm-hmm. Right? And so now what does it mean to be, to expand this mo- notion of reliability to those people who are often on the outskirts who we typically don't, they don't belong to me, that ain't my business. 
right? Where yeah. there's there's deeper work for us to do to bring that community of reliable others in really meaningful ways um, that has the power to transcend this notion that we've been socialized to think that it's just about me. Absolutely. And, it, and you know, growing up in this culture, we're all conditioned to feel that way, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, it's tough to fight against it, but we, I, we really truly believe we have to. Um, I thank you for your compliment, but the reason I ask you to define it, the reason I do what I do is because, I mean, I can't sit through one more panel discussion or podcast or talk show where people talk around and about issues, but we're not getting yeah. at solutions. Yeah. So unless you're really speaking about what it takes to, make change if you're not listening you're not willing to do then why are you talking i don't want to hear you talk mm-hmm, just to hear yourself mm-hmm, talk like mm-hmm. what are you going to do to make a difference uh in the world i think that's really important um you know also i know you know again it's funny faith comes up because obviously we're both people of deep faith mm-hmm. but it also influences and, and informs what we're doing you know people forget that i think at the core the bible is really and and certainly jesus really helping us to understand and teach us about what it means and what it takes to live in healthy community Mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. That fundamentally is at the core of almost everything. And uh, and we, we talk around it, we talk about it, but we don't, we're not, we're not being about it. And I just want to see us at least understand and publicly acknowledge what we have to be about. If you decide not to be about it, that's your decision. But this moving around in darkness, pretending that you don't know what it is anymore. No. No yeah, those days are over. Those days are over. And, you know, I think I find that, like, there are many of us who desire to, like, make deeper connection in this way. Um, but it often feels just overwhelming. Like, how in the hell am yeah. I supposed to solve? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this entire corridor of problems. Um, but, you know, to, to borrow a little bit from Dr. Ellison again, is this notion about the three feet around us, right? Yeah. Um, is that, you know, we often try to come into a situation and trying to solve the entire problem and all the complexities of it. And what he actually suggests is that we are just, if we would just focus on the three feet around us, which is an arm's length, depending on how tall you are, mm-hmm. right? Which is about, if you're concerned just about your neighbor and that neighbor's concerned about their neighbor and that neighbor's concerned about their neighbor, right? The, yeah. the, the work now becomes more manageable yeah. of ensuring that we are caring for one another and showing up for one another and being kind to one another and showing the love of Christ to people. Right. I mean, I think that was often the model that Jesus tried to portray was that like, yeah, like we live in this like society and like all these types of different things are going on, but what about your neighbor? Mm-hmm. Like literally the people who live on your block. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I, I've actually never really heard people take it down to that level, but like when we take it out of this kind of like social big thing and down into this thing, God, Jesus was really calling us when he talks about being mindful of the neighbor, he would just, just take just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just take what you can do right by the people who are right next to you. And if everybody takes that, takes that approach, we actually can move forward to, toward liberation much faster than if we try to do it out of Washington, D.C. Absolutely. And That's much good. faster when you also do the other thing that Jesus did, which is go inside and understand that all you need is inside you, that the kingdom of heaven yes. is inside you, yeah. that the solution to your problems is inside you. It starts with yeah. perspective. It starts with understanding who and what you are and whose you are. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the theme of the podcast this season is hope, healing, and love. And I'm so curious to hear from you. What does hope look like for black single moms and how can we as community contribute to providing that hope? Hmm. You know, that's a good question. To me, hope for black single mothers. Um <laughs> is really about um i'm gonna have to (laughs) feel so cliche because of who i'm talking to but it really is about the embodiment Mm -hmm. of infinite possibilities Mm -hmm. i'm and you know when i talk with you know our friends on stage and power conversation we're so big on language hope is about how do I become what it is that I desire 
Mm-hmm. So often um, our desires are external, right? That we are looking for love and we're look all, all the way out here. And I want for black, my hope for black single mothers, that they live in a world that the things that they desire are curated within themselves first. Mm. And that is, that seems almost like, you know, in the air, but, I, but, I, but with, to your point about solutions, when we are solving for these social issues around mm-hmm. money, around poverty, around food insecurity, around housing insecurity, around the kinds of education that their children have access to. When we solve for those things, it actually frees them up to be able to lean inside of themselves and begin to embody all of the things that they had actually hoped and hope for hope for others. Right. Yeah. And that is my hope. And that is, that is the thing that I am often striving for is that we are not just talking about what needs to happen, that we are not just getting on TV and getting on podcasts and pontificating about these ideals and ideas but that we are actually putting, creating the conditions for those for Black single mothers to actually embody the things that they actually hope for others. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, I, I really wish I could like draw it out on tra- <laughs> like chart paper, right? <laughs> because I feel like yeah. words are not enough to really But, you know, I I just think about the legacy of of Black single mothers and the ways in which we have carried entire generations on our backs, Mm -hmm. right? Where we have been responsible for the care for entire communities, where we have fed and clothed and ensured the safety of those who were were seeking safety, Mm -hmm. right? And to turn around and ensure that the generation after you, the children that you're responsible for raising, are in a place well enough that they can show up at school every day, learn to be good humans, be kind to folks, right? That's a huge responsibility. And so our commitment as a community, you ask this question about what it is that you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can donate to organizations like Current Project. (laughs) And, (laughs) and, but no, but seriously, you can just look around at the community of Black single mothers around you. We all know what we all know are in relationship with one and literally ask a question. And you're going to have to ask it like multiple times. Mm-hmm. What is it that I can do for you? Yeah. What is it that I can do for you? The answer may be nothing. Oh, girl, I'm good. You know, that's not true. Ask the question again and really mean it. What is it that I can do for you to ensure that you can thrive? And what we often find, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 continue. (laughs) And what we'll often find is that their desires, the things that they want the most, Mm -hmm. entire communities get to benefit from. And see, first of all, you don't cut anyone off, especially women. And the second reason you don't do that is because you answered the question I was about to ask you, Mm. which was exactly that, because we're all so self-focused and self-indulged sometimes that we forget about, not that this is the reason to do it, but we forget about the benefit to self and the benefit to community that can come from Mm. being generous, your time, your space, your money, your heart for other people. Right blessing yourself whenever you bless another human being. Listen, let me, let me, let me put it in context. Black single mother, black and brown single, uh, female head of households are one of the most common household types in most urban cities, Chicago, East Brook, uh, East New York, Atlanta, doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the social ills of our time around poverty, around low reading, reading test scores around, you know, homelessness, all of those different things. That if we are really intentional about putting money and resources behind that housing demographic alone, is that we actually create the the groundwork 
for the end breaking of breaking some of these social things up in entire communities. I mean, it's just basic math, right? And so I think that that is a, um, a way for us to reimagine this conversation about Black single mothers, that it's not just a social ill, it's not just something that we have like, you know, uh, put up on the mantle to say, oh my gosh, you guys are just doing such great work. But it really is a solvent. If we put money and energy and resources and policy thinking just on that household type, it really can be a solvent for entire communities to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we do what we do. And this is why I love talking about this work because it, it interrupts the narrative. And it interrupts the kind of stale thinking about Black single mothers. And it really gives us a new way of reimagining hope. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it's, it's important for people to understand that none of the issues that we face are singular. They're all mm -hmm. interconnected and they all come mm -hmm. from a foundation of essentially lovelessness in our society. Mm -hmm. to find a way mm -hmm. to move to building institutions in a society that's more loving most of the ills are going to start to melt away automatically. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I want to, it's related and I want to call this out because it is an interesting experience I had with a young brother uh, a few years ago. Uh, I won't mention his name for reasons that will become clear pretty quickly, but um, he was in a <laughs> relationship and it was, it was pretty traumatic for him. It was a sister and she was giving him the business and she was giving him a hard time. And she, she didn't, she honestly didn't sound like the most wonderful person in the world, but, mm -hmm. What I explained to him was he also talked about his mom and his mom uh, being, you know, abused and, and, and such by his dad, right? And how frustrated it made him feel that she didn't stand up for herself and he, you know, had to step in and he, you know, did some things to protect his mother because, you know, he loved her. And he was also proud of his sister because she was doing so well in school and she was, mm. she, she didn't need anybody. She could take care of everything herself. Mm. She's going to get not mm. one, but two degrees, graduate early, all the things. She's like, I want my mom to be more like my sister. And, da, 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 da. Mm. and so he's like, yeah, I think I'm done. I think I'm done with black women because, you know, I can't. It's just, they're too much. They're this, they're that, they're whatever. So I let him go. I just let him speak. And this is not to beat up on brothers, by the way, because I absolutely advocate for us. And I think black men, we have our own challenges and where we have our own need for care and help people to help us not mm -hmm. only survive, but thrive. And we'll get into that in other future conversations because uh, I absolutely stand up for us. But in this particular case, he was starting to lean in this direction. He's like, I'm done. No more black women, whatever. And I listened to him and I was like, listen to what you're saying. Listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. Think about this for a minute. Not because black men are bad, but because of all the things that are going on in society, black women are often in a space where they have to be the head of the household and the sole parent. Mm -hmm. Think about what it takes to do that. I was raised by a single mother. Now, luckily, she had a village of her family, immediate family mm -hmm. that could help. But think about what it takes to do that. You have to be tenacious. Mm -hmm. You have to balance the books. You've got to be an alchemist, basically, to get things done. Mm -hmm. You've got mm -hmm. to stand up and advocate for yourself. You've got to fight yeah. for everything. You've got to tell a little boy whose hard head is going to get harder as he gets older what to do and mm -hmm. what not to do and put your foot That's down. Right. All the things that it takes to survive yeah. the coping mechanisms, the tools, the things that it takes to survive, when you use those things over time, those coping skills start becoming part of who you, of who are. you are. And amazing. when your circumstances change, if you've tied your circumstances, your Ooh. identity to your circumstances, now good. you've got this identity that you can't take off. So That's you're going to be aggressive. You're going to be whatever, because you're used to doing that to keep not only your family but this race alive, that's mm. a heavy burden to bury. And you can't put that down. You don't have people bringing empire to your feet to show you all the that's wealth good. and riches that they got from conquering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to understand the societal reasons why we all are what we are. You sure. got to understand that the things that look amazing when you're doing it for this reason are irritating over here and they're all part of the same mix. And so if we just really exist in a community and look out for each other and show up for each other. And yes, as mm -hmm. you said, ask and ask again, because I used to do mm -hmm. that. I'm like, oh, you need anything? Okay. Was it, I asked, they said they didn't need anything. No. I thought they didn't need anything. <laughs> I now know as I'm older, I probably, not probably, I should have done more. I should have just dropped it in the account on my That's own right. or shown up, you know, 
And I get that now. And I just want to yeah. make sure everybody else understands that because um, we go, we owe sisters a great debt. Uh, and we'll get into why there's so many single parents and all that stuff. I think there's shared reasons for that. But sure, that's sure. another conversation. But thank you so much for the work you do because yes. it's really important work. And, thank your, and you. your vulnerability. Um, I got another question for you before we go. Um, a couple of them, actually. What does success look like? For the current project, where do you go from here? I love that question. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you the like answer. Uh, um, success is for the current project is we're a multi-million dollar budget running organization with hired staff and reach all across the country and all of those things that we often nail as like on a nonprofit side of success that we're able to reach um, countless black single mothers to help them close that social and economic gap and make an impact around policy success. And I'm able to roll myself off as executive director, hire somebody who's more fantastic than me and I go off into the sunset and write my New York Times best-selling book. That's success, okay? <laughs> but success for the current project looks like when there's no need for the current project. Yes. As a nonprofit, and I mean, I'm pretty sure the nonprofit gods are like, oh, I'm going to do that. Success is not being able to say as an organization that we reached a thousand more mothers next year than we did this year because there was such a need. Not a win to me. A win to me is when this world is in a place where it is caring for the lives of Black single mothers and their children in such a way that there's no need for a current project anymore. That is success. Work me out of a job, fam. Amen. Because that is the real signal that what we are calling for in this world has caught up with the work that we're doing. And there's no need for us anymore. That is success. Wow. That, I mean, so I sit here quite often asking questions <laughs> and I have the answers inside me and I'm just hoping, praying that the guest gets it and sees it or whatever. Quite often that's not the case. But when I tell you that was the answer that I was hoping that you would say, because that's the thing with not-for-profits. Yeah. My God, you should be working for a day when you're no longer necessary. No longer needed. That's the win. I remember yeah. working for a religious organization. I'll keep it very general. And I remember they mm -hmm. were like, oh my gosh, the food pantry this year, this is not FCDC, by the way, but <laughs> the food pantry <laughs> this year, well, uh, we served 20,000 more people than last year. Everybody clapped. They're like clapping and like drinking church punch and like cutting cakes because they serve so many people. And I was sitting there like, that's not a win, fam. <laughs> That means there were 20,000 more people who are food insecure. <laughs> what? And so, and that's actually very early in my work when I first moved here is what, what I was like, man, if I ever worked in a nonprofit, that has to be the mantra, fam. The win is not serving more people. The win is when we are no longer in business because there's no longer a need because people are getting their needs met in the world. Wow. Alicia, you know, you're a great conversation. You're a great Thanks. guest. Uh, and for multiple reasons. I mean, I had a great time talking to you. But the other reason I say that is because you are the perfect kind of person that shows how getting in touch with, embracing, and loving mm -hmm. your authentic self mm -hmm. then empowers you to find your purpose in the world, mm. which then empowers you to love who you are and be comfortable sharing your story and using your gifts and your story to serve other yeah. people. You are a Thank perfect you. example of that in Thank action. You. And I lift that up to celebrate you, but also to inspire people who are listening. This is the work. Figure out mm. who you are. Fall in love with that person. I don't mean that vanity kind of love. I mean mm. that love of thank you, God, for creating me. I'm here for a reason. I got a sense of who I am. I love who I am. And now I want to go in the world and be that person. I want to use these gifts mm. to serve That's other good. people. 
I want to live a full, joyful life. You are an embodiment of that. And Thank I'm grateful you. for you as a friend, and I'm grateful to, for, to know you and for this conversation. And the last question I have is really this. You know, the work you do obviously is critically important, right? Um, and it clearly sits in the not-for-profit and advocacy space. Uh, but I also hold it up as a creative pursuit. You've got to be creative in your approaches to solutions to these problems. You've got to be creative in imagining and reimagining what the organization looks like. How, first of all, do you agree? And secondly, what do you do to continue to fuel and empower your own creativity? Do you engage in arts? Do you, you know, what do you do to fuel that creativity that then fuels the work that you're engaged in? That's so good. Yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I often find that I, I struggle leading this work from my Harlem apartment, often just in isolation with myself in the four walls and my dog cookie. And, and I often find that I'm always up against a creative block where I'm just like, I don't know how to reimagine <laughs> this, pro- this program or this issue in any other way. Um, and I, you know, full transparency, I often find that I really do struggle with that. Mm-hmm. But then I go and find, you know, what's really my creative solvent is music. Music. I go pull out some uh, Bonnie James and some Beyonce and some James Cleveland and some, or things that have a heavy instrumentation to it, uh, some Jacob Collier some Yanni, the classical Mm -hmm. pianist. I use music to really pull me out of this like muck and mire. And I put on my, you know, noise canceling headphones and I try to follow medleys. I try to follow bass lines. And that is really the way that I use, that I get get my creative juice is music. Mm -hmm. As you know, I love to sing and all those different things. And and it's interesting to bring this conversation full circle about, you know, when I was growing up, I was musically inclined. I was a classically trained pianist. I sang, I was in a marching band, I played trumpet, I played saxophone and music has always been that thing. And we were talking about how like these parallel tracks and how giftings come up and come back and sometimes you use them as some. And I find that music is that creative solvent for me. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, for all intents and purposes, I'm not a musician. I don't play piano anymore. I don't play the saxophone anymore. Um, but it is the thing that has that keeps my creative juices going. And it's actually something that I use in our work when we do our cohorts and they're working on a little thing, honey, I'll put on a little trap music or, a little, <laughs> or you know, or something that's going to really get people going because music is a universal language. It is some, It is so work it is something that connects to our soul and our spirit and that's the creative juice that i use and i love that for me because it doesn't matter where i am in the world what i got going on when i need to reconnect to my creative self music is the way that i do it so yeah i love it thank you for thank you for that and thank you for your vulnerability and your your um your all your contributions to our society it's been a pleasure talking to you where can people support the current current project and where can they find you online? Yes. So you can go to www.thecurrentproject.org. Uh, we are on Instagram at The Current Project Inc. and on Twitter and on Facebook under The Current Project. Uh, we are always looking for uh, moms to join our work. And we are also always looking for donations toward our work. We cannot do this important work for Black single mothers without funding and so we want to invite you to partner with us on that and of course i am on instagram and on facebook under d star writer dot d star writer five nine on instagram twitter and just alicia gordon on facebook so that's where i am that's what's up we will put that in the show notes so people who uh find it online can click there and you sound like my mama with that www you know you don't have to talk about <laughs> <writing. laughs> Born in 82, child. I'm in that weird generation, Gen X, millennial. I don't know. WWW. WWW. Ricky, it's the. I'm like, mom, I, mm. she's going to kill me for talking about it. I feel shame. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, once again, thank you for joining us. This is uh, Alicia Gordon, Reverend Alicia Gordon to y'all, but uh, Alicia L. Gordon it is. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Be well.